today two, two different drugs, and the common theme between them is that they're albumin-based. And so it's either albumin conjugated to a drug or it's albumin associated with a drug. So you'll hear quite a bit about uh, what albumin as a carrier has the capability of doing when you combine it with different types of molecules. So I'm gonna do the first presentation and Felix Kratz, who should be around here somewhere, is gonna do the second presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Okay, so um, just for disclosure, uh, I'm a stockholder in Celgene Corp, and then the, when I discuss neoadjuvant breast cancer, which is a new uh, area, investigational area, that's, it's not an approved uh, indication for a Braxin. So uh, I think you all have probably heard of a Braxin before, uh, but I'll just go through the basics. Uh, it's an albumin-based nanoparticle, and uh, we take a drug, paclitaxel, and coat it with albumin and uh, create this cross-linked shell uh, which contains the core of the drug and then the cross-linked albumin uh, on the outside. And then uh, what that, so these are nanoparticles of about 130 nanometers which are uh, in a lyophilized form in the vial. And then when you reconstitute it and inject it, these particles will break down into uh, albumin-bound paclitaxel, which is shown over uh, on, on the left side, or right side for you. And uh, the drug now is approved in breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, in advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer, and in metastatic pancreatic cancer. And there's, uh, the, the reason why it works uh, the way it does is uh, because it uses albumin as a carrier, and albumin can accumulate in tumors <laughs> due to different mechanisms, whether it's uh, transcytosis of albumin across epithelial cells, or uh, some tumors have uptake of albumin for nutritional source for the tumor. So different mechanisms can lead to uptake of albumin into the tumor. And we're, what we're doing is piggybacking on those mechanisms and leveraging albumin transport. So uh, albumin, as you all know, is a, it's a natural carrier for hydrophobic molecules. And a lot of the fat, fatty acids, vitamins, hormones are carried by albumin through uh, the body and into the tissues. Uh, tumors can take albumin uh, as a nutrition source because they can get all the fatty acids and vitamins, et cetera, that they need to proliferate and survive. And the drug, as I mentioned, uh, when it's combined with albumin, uh, you can have several binding sites of paclitaxel on albumin. There's probably six to eight binding sites. Uh, just like albumin carries fatty acids, it can carry hydrophobic molecules like um, paclitaxel. Uh, so the, the, the transport properties of albumin are very interesting. And uh, here you see these are uh, endothelial cells. And uh, we're seeing a TEM of endothelial cells. And what can happen is when you have albumin, that can trigger the formation of cavioli. And these cavioli are little vacuole-like structures but they transcytose, so go from one side to the other side, and they transport their contents from the lumen side of the blood vessel into the tissue. And that's what happens with albumin transport. And uh, we're, again, leveraging those prop natural properties of albumin. Uh, on the right side, you see um, fluorescent label paclitaxel uh, in albumin nanoparticles that have taken up into an endothelial cell. And the spots that you see, the bright spots, are in fact the cavioli that have the nanoparticle albumin uh, bound paclitaxel inside. And then this is another publication that shows very nicely, if you take gold labeled albumin particles, you can see very clearly that this is on the blood vessel, the lumen side, and then uh, at the bottom is the perivascular space. So these nanoparticles, actually you can see them forming the cavioli. They get into the cavioli, they get uh, into the middle of the cell, and then they, in fact they're released on the other side uh, into the, um, uh, the interstitial space. And so this active transport occurs, and which we believe uh, occurs for a Braxane, and that's the way the drug uh, gets transported into the interstitium of the, uh, of the tumor or other tissue. 
So this is a uh, uh, picture, an artist's rendition of the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see these receptors, uh, which are on the endothelial cell on the inside of the blood vessel. And when the albumin binds them, or the albumin-bound paclitaxel binds them, it, it triggers the cavioli formation and then transport of the, of the drug. We know from independent studies that albumin can accumulate in tumors. So this is an example of gadolinium labeled albumin, which is imaged using MRI and in, uh, in a xenograft model. And you can see the accumulation of albumin in sort of central core of the tumor. Uh, that was in mice, but you can also see this in humans. So I in humans, this study has been done where there's a fluorescent label albumin has been injected into patients. And then these are patients with glioblastoma. So when they're operated on, uh, the fluorescence helps the surgeons detect the margins of the tumor. And in, uh, this was done in about 13 patients uh, prior to the surgery. And then the, the, the tumor fluorescence uh, in, in 11 of those patients uh, was good enough that they got a very good margin around the tumor. And this is actually an image of that. So again, it shows even in a glioblastoma, uh, which is supposedly in the, br in, in the brain and blood-brain barrier, et cetera, you can get albumin into the tumor and thereby um, it, it, it's a good carrier uh, for drugs to, um, uh, to develop into different drug delivery systems. Uh, this is again a, a slide of tumor uptake of paclitaxel bound to albumin in the nanoparticle form. And uh, you see here, this is a ratio. Uh, if you have the original cremophore paclitaxel, which is uh, the first paclitaxel that was approved, that was also known as Taxol, uh, and you compare it with albumin bound paclitaxel, which we call MAP paclitaxel. If you look at the tumor level, you get a higher level uh, of drug in the tumor relative to the normal tissue uh, compared to uh, if you have a Braxane or, or NAP paclitaxel versus um, uh, the conventional cremophore paclitaxel. And, and this shows that there's some effect of the carrier bringing the drug into the tumor uh, at a higher level. Uh, we've done this in different tumor types and it's uh, almost across all two tumor types you see that. This is in a rhabdomyosarcoma, and uh, this is a conventional paclitaxel given at 30, uh, so this cremophore paclitaxel at 30 mg per kilo dose, and this is a Braxane at 50 mg per kilo. So it's a slightly higher dose, but you get four times higher level of drug in the tumor. So there's clearly more accumulation. Uh, as far as, this is old published data, uh, but uh, again, when we first developed the, the drug and started to do doing, doing the anti-tumor efficacy tests across different tumor types, whether it's a breast cancer, lung cancer, ovarian, prostate, uh, the, the pink curves are the Braxane uh, and then the green curves are the Taxol. And whether it was equidose or equitoxic dose, we were able to get a better efficacy uh, from uh, the Braxane. So in, in the early phase one studies, uh, we saw this interesting effect, um, and, and these are, this is a patient who had been treated with uh, a taxane, so with paclitaxel uh, or taxol, and they did not respond. And so therefore, they were put on a braxane therapy, and they surprisingly respond. So it's the same active agent, but with a different carrier, and now we're seeing that the, obviously the drug is getting there and then doing... Um, what it's supposed to do to the tumor. So this gave us the first indication clinically uh, that there is something different about uh, this molecule when you, uh, when you create it in the form of nanoparticles with albumin as compared to conventional uh, paclitaxel. And then we started looking at different mechanisms and we still continue to, to uh, discover uh, different mechanisms of how the drug in fact gets to the tumor. Uh, we subsequently went on to do a breast cancer phase three trial. That was a head-to-head -head trial uh, of Abraxane versus Taxol, or Nampaclitaxel versus Taxol. And in that trial, uh, we had the endpoint was a response rate endpoint. It was in 454 patients, and you could see we had a 33% response rate versus a 18.7% response rate uh, for Taxol. And on the basis of this data, the drug was approved. Uh, we also had a survival benefit when the patients were treated in second-line therapy or greater, 
and the survival benefit was uh, about two and a half months uh, in, in that case. And again, remember that you're, you're, this is paclitaxel versus paclitaxel. So it's not a, a, a two different molecules. But despite that, you're able to see the differences in an adequately powered trial. Uh, the, the next target for us was uh, non-small cell lung cancer, and we did the same type of study, uh, but the conventional treatment in lung cancer is paclitaxel with a platinum. Uh, it's a combination treatment. So, uh, so paclitaxel carboplatin is the standard, and so we went head-to-head -head of NAP paclitaxel carboplatin, the large trial of 1,050 patients, and again, it was a response rate endpoint, and so when you look at all patients, there was an uh, increase in response rate of 33 versus 25 uh, percent. But what was very surprising that in, in lung cancer, when you look at it by histology, there's two main histologies in lung cancer, which is adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And in the squamous cell population, there was a dramatic difference in the response rate. We had a 41 percent versus 24 percent. But in the adenocarcinoma, it was more or less the same. So this was an interesting uh, observation. And uh, it was, of course, a post hoc analysis. But this uh, tells us something about potential differences in mechanism between the drugs and uh, that is related to a particular histology. And so squamous cells, for whatever reason, take up maybe more albumin than uh, than conventional adenocarcinoma cells. So uh, this is being investigated further in other trials that are focusing only on squamous carcinomas, and uh, we'll see what those results are. Uh, also, the other interesting factor in this study, which was very interesting, in patients who were more than 70 uh, years of age, when you looked at uh, the survival benefit, you had a 10-month survival with conventional paclitaxel, but you had almost 20 months with uh, the NAB paclitaxel. So that is a dramatic difference. Again, this was a post hoc analysis, but uh, in the aged population, uh, these patients, it's possibly a, a, a multitude of reasons. One of them could be that the drug is better tolerated, and therefore the patients are able to stay on therapy for a longer time. Uh, and then combined with uh, other aspects of, uh, you know, improved tumor uptake and things like that. So that is quite a dramatic difference. And again, these are being followed up in further studies uh, that are ongoing. Uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer was the next target. And uh, again, if you know the history of pancreatic cancer, gemcitabine you used to be the standard of care uh, uh, in pancreatic cancer. And uh, the typical survival uh, in metastatic pancreatic cancer um, is about six months, and uh, th which is what we saw in the trial. This is a head-to-head -head trial of 860 patients, gemcitabine versus the combination. And if you know, the, again, the history of pancreatic cancer treatment over the last 20 years, there has not been any real improvement in treatment of pancreatic cancer. There was only one uh, drug that was approved in pancreatic cancer which is erlotinib, uh, and that improved survival by about <coughs> one week or 10 days over the standard gemcitabine. Uh, so this showed about a two-month increase in survival uh, over the uh, gemcitabine alone, and on the basis of this, the drug was approved in pancreatic cancer. Now uh, it's a standard regimen uh, for pancreatic cancer treatment. Uh, so. What I wanted to bring to you was sort of the new data. And uh, recently, there was, um, we have gone into neoadjuvant uh, treatment of breast cancer. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term, uh, it's neoadjuvant means treatment prior to surgery, effectively. So in early stage breast cancer, the first line of attack is really surgery when the tumor is localized. So uh, there have been studies to show that if you do chemotherapy or some treatment uh, with drugs prior to the surgery, then you may get a better outcome. And so this is what we are pursuing. And this is an example of uh, prior to uh, any treatment, uh, that's a tumor, you can see the shadow, and then after chemo, 
uh, you reduce the size of the tumor, you make it more amenable to surgery, and then the patient goes to uh, a lumpectomy. So effectively, you downstage the disease, uh, you make surgery easier, you could breast conservation is maybe possible after treatment because the tumor has shrunk down. A and it's an opportunity also uh, from a translational perspective, you have access to all of this tissue, the tumor, which is readily accessible, it's localized, so you can see directly the effect of the drug uh, on the tumor. And what you try to achieve is a pathologic complete response, of, or what's known as the PCR rate, and which is essentially all disappearance of the tumor. Uh, so when a, when a tumor, sa uh, after treatment, you take a biopsy and the pathologist has to see no evidence of tumor whatsoever, and we call that a PCR. So this is the typical endpoint in neoadjuvant treatment. And uh, the options of neoadjuvant treatment that are available today, uh, sometimes they do uh, endocrine therapy prior to the surgery, or chemotherapy is pretty common, which is a combination of anthracycline and taxanes, uh, and even cyclophosphamide, and it depends whether you're in the US or Europe, there's slightly different regimens. Uh, for those patients who have HER2 positive disease, uh, then they, on top of that, they will get uh, trastuzumab or Herceptin, for example, or Lapatinib or Pertuzumab. Uh, radiotherapy is also an option. And then other novel agents are being tested in this setting, uh, which include Abraxane, include uh, TDM1, mTOR inhibitors, some kinase inhibitors, et cetera. So uh, the trial that I'm going to talk about is uh, a, a fairly large trial that was done in this setting. Now, uh, very recently, the FDA, um, uh, you know, proposed a guidance on neoadjuvant treatment. Until um, very recently, there were no drugs that are approved in the neoadjuvant setting. So this was not a place that um, pharma companies would go do trials because there was no approval pathway. Uh, but now this opened up uh, the strategy of going into the neoadjuvant setting very early on prior to any um, definitive treatment like surgery. Uh, so, and in those, in that guidance, PCR is recommended as the, the endpoint. Uh, and clearly the FDA recognizes the, the benefit and there's a certain definitions of uh, the pathologic complete response. A and the <laughs> rationale for the use of PCR as an endpoint is that there may be potentially longer survival for those patients who achieve a PCR or complete disappearance of tumor. Um, and uh, so, but that needs to be monitored in the longer term. And the clinical trial design that's recommended is, uh, you know, the typical randomized control trial, a superiority design, et cetera. So that was the, the, the trial that we designed. Uh, and this was done actually by a German group, which is called, and the trial was named uh, uh, Gepar Septo. It's a very large trial, it's 1,200 patients. And uh, they took, uh, there were two arms of the trial, uh, and uh, the, which are coded by color here, just so you, you see them. And, and so surgery is the final endpoint uh, of where the patients go to surgery and tissue is recovered for pathologic uh, analysis. But prior to that, uh, you see the, the different uh, treatments. And it's either paclitaxel, so conventional cremophore or taxol, uh, paclitaxel, followed by epirupazin and cyclophosphamide. That's here, and this is a common uh, European regimen. Or it's instead of paclitaxel, we use NAB paclitaxel or Braxane, uh, and followed by epirupazin and cyclophosphamide. In those patients that have HER2 positive disease, uh, you give them trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Uh, and that's only for the HER2 positive patients. And then you, 12 weeks of treatment with the taxane, 12 weeks with uh, uh, epirubicin cyclophosphamide, the patients go to surgery, you take the tissue and you uh, measure the level of the pathologic complete response rate. So that was the design of the trial. And uh, the results are here, uh, summarized results. So uh, efficacy, the primary endpoint PCR rate in the entire population. So the, the patients that were on the NAP arm had a 38% uh, 
pathologic complete response rate, meaning disappearance of all tumor, versus 29% for the cremophore paclitaxel arm. So this was um, superior in terms of uh, removing all pathological si signs of the tumor. And now this is all patients in the trial. Uh, what was very interesting, if you looked at the triple negative subset, so these are patients who are ER, PR, HER2 negative. And this is, as you all know, it's a very difficult population to treat because these tumors tend to be extremely aggressive when they, uh, they're, uh, they're triple negative tumors. And there's really no good treatment options out there. So in the subset of these 1,200 patients, we had 275 patients that had triple negative disease. And if you looked at the response rates in those patients, uh, which is actually shown in these graphs below, we had a 48% response rate versus 25. So almost doubling of the pathologic complete response rate in these, pa in these patients. So this result, uh, again, is quite dramatic and, and uh, a significant improvement over standard therapy. And, and uh, we have to, of course, follow up to see uh, if this translates ultimately into disease-free survival and better overall survival, but that'll happen over a much longer period of time. Uh, so so that this PCR rate you can get after 24 weeks of therapy. So that's uh, the result. Uh, and for comparison, how does this stack up versus other uh, trials that have been done in the new adjuvant uh, breast cancer setting? So these are the results of our trial. Um, if you look at, there's another trial called Neotango, and they have these nice names, uh, with 800 patients that received epirubicin, cyclophosphamide, and paclitaxel, plus or minus gemcitabine, so two randomized trial. And the PCR rates, adding the gemcitabine to this trial didn't really change much. The PCR rates were about 15 to 20% in this population. So you can compare that to these numbers here, uh, so which are significantly higher. In this trial, which is called the Neosphere trial, 400 patients, these are the HER2 positive subset. So, uh, so only HER2 positive. And they received, of course, the pertuzumab, trastuzumab, in, and in addition, uh, uh, docetaxel. So they were randomized to either docetaxel or no docetaxel. And if you look at uh, in the triple combination here, uh, they had a 45 uh, or 46% response rate. Uh, so if you look at the same population in, in our study, in the HER2 positive patients, with NAP paclitaxel arm, we had 61.8. You can see the 45 there. And the conventional paclitaxel was 54, which was in fact higher than that. So of course, this is cross-trial comparison. But the, the results look very positive in this trial. and. So the, the next step is, you know, can we take this to a registration strategy? We're investigating that at the present time. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, this is just uh, results that came out fairly recently, so I'm glad to share them with you. And I'd like to acknowledge, you know, a whole host of uh, different collaborators, clinically and otherwise. So we have time for a few questions, uh, and then we'll transition to the next speaker. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Actually, I just want to know what type of conjugation uh, is between albumin and paclitaxel. I mean, whether it is they are physically conjugated or by chemically conjugated. Yeah, so, so there is no, uh, there's not a covalent link uh, between albumin and paclitaxel. This is a, um, you would say, a hydrophobic association between the two molecules. Okay. The Thank next speaker is going to talk about a covalent linkage, so you will get both sides of the story. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Maybe I can catch on to that. Um, I can match you the house. No, no, go ahead. Oh, you, my microphone? Sorry. <laughs> you, you mentioned the uptake mechanism. Uh, 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 how important is uh, the size of the uh, albumin nanoparticle? In, in the morning, you described how the nanoparticles disintegrate. Is there a kind of a threshold below the particle size must be that they are uptaken, or is it only monomeric uh, uh, serum albumin which is uptaken? Do you have any information on that? 
Yeah, so, so that's a good question, but it's a complex question to answer uh, because it's, a di it's sort of a difficult thing to actually do an experiment because you can't just uh, have, you know, a monomeric albumin or, you know, polymeric albumin and then do the study. So the short answer is we don't have the data for that, but we find that based on several issues, um, you know, that include the, 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 s the side effect profile when you test in animals, of course, uh, or the biodistribution, or even manufacturing issues, it's best to be at about the 130 nanometer size of the nanoparticles uh, as the, the nanoparticle that you create. That, of course, then breaks down into its species once it's, um, it's in the body. But it's a, it's a challenging question to answer, you know, is this one better than the other one? I think they all contribute in different ways, but we still have to evaluate. So, uh, I mean, you mentioned there was a fourfold increase in uptake compared to ordinary taxol. Yeah. Um, I suppose that's mostly based on, on animal studies, or maybe you have human data as well. No, no, but no, is, no. That, is that CMAX or AUC, and is that over, if it's AUC, is it over a whole dosing cycle? And a related question, is the dosing in patients every three weeks or weekly? Is that the same as Taxol nowadays? Okay. And uh, you mentioned toxicities are, are less. Um, is that true or they're just different toxicities? Can you okay. expand so you a bit? Have, you have three questions yeah. in there. I'll try and remember all of them and <laughs> answer. So, so the first question, the slide that I showed on the increased tumor uptake, that's an AUC in the tumor, mm -hmm. right? So over whatever time period we did that. So um, I think that answers your question. Well, is that, is that a week then, the AUC? Uh, I think it was a few days. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be 48 hours, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. But uh, we published, that data is published, mm -hmm. so we can, I can give you the reference, you can look it up. Um, the, the second question, you was on the schedule of administration. Uh, there's both three weekly schedules and a weekly schedule. Mm -hmm. So for example, in metastatic breast cancer, the three weekly schedule is approved. And in uh, pancreatic cancer, a uh, weekly schedule is approved. So given three weeks out of four weeks. Uh, and then your last question was on the safety mm. uh, aspect. Is it different? Uh, so what we see is, um, again, all of this information is published, is that on the neutropenia side, we have much lower neutropenia, despite the fact that we're dosing at a higher dose and a higher cumulative dose. Uh, uh, on uh, a lot of the other side effects, uh, I mean, we don't need, um, uh, for example, pre-medication for hypersensitivity. So the hypersensitivity is not there with uh, the albumin formulation where it was with the uh, other formulation. Uh, on the neurotoxicity, the, the neuropathy, we have a higher level, but it's categorically different in that it's very reversible. So we have a 21-day half-life, if you will, of the neuropathy where the, it drops a full grade uh, by 21 days. Whereas if you have conventional paclitaxel, those ne that neuropathies last for six months longer, sometimes never go away. Thank you. Um, I also had a question regarding the uh, albumin uptake. So in vivo, you observed increased uptake with the albumin bound paclitaxel. Previous to that, did you observe exactly the same tendency in vitro? Can you tell that? So is uh, the, the uptake in tumor cells in vitro yeah. also increased if you have uh, albumin-bound uh, paclitaxel? cell? In vitro. In vitro. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't believe we have the data for in vitro uptake. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but we have a comparison, like an IC50, on different cell lines. And there are some cell lines where you see dramatically different IC50, you know, like a tenfold lower IC50, which means it's uh, more active. Whether that means more uptake or something else, is, we don't know, we, uh, we've not measured it, but we have seen that. And in, in particular in squamous uh, uh, carcinoma in vitro, we've seen, uh, for example, a tenfold IC50 difference, which was surprising. Never expected that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Neil, for presenting these uh, very encouraging data, uh, especially, I think, the group of triple negative breast cancer patients. 
gives you a very nice advantage. My question, uh, well, you answered one of my questions regarding the neurotoxicity, but I was wondering about, there is a recommendation to give Abraxane quickly, you know, in a short infusion. Is, is this something that is critical to the, to the performance of the, of, the, uh, of the product and to the drive, driving force yeah. to get the drug in the tumor? Uh, you know, uh, again, that's a great question. Um, I think I'm thinking back historically now, you know, how we arrived at the, the 30 minutes infusion as opposed to, you know, tax all used to be given over three hours, right? Uh, so convenience is a big factor. Uh, we don't have any safety issues with a fast infusion. So for the clinic, it's, it's much better. Uh, whether that actually, if you did a 30 minute versus three hour infusion, whether that would change the, uh, the safety profile or efficacy profile, uh, we don't have the data. The only time we did a three hour infusion was in our original phase one, before we went to the 30 minutes, the FDA had asked us that first do a three hour infusion in a few patients because that was the standard for Taxol. And if that's okay, then you move up to 30 minutes. The, the reason I'm saying that is because yeah. uh, we, there, is, there are historical data in which if you extend the paclitaxel infusion, you could reduce neurotoxicity. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you could, again, uh, still give this nice dose of 125, yeah. but give it along three hours and get less neurotoxicity. No, that valid question. I mean, we've been asked that before. And the, the other thing is when we do a weekly dosing versus three weekly, so you, because the dosing on, on the three weekly schedule is 260 per meter square. On the weekly, weekly it's either 100 or 125. The neurotoxicity is much lower on the weekly schedule at the lower dose. And it's given? It's given a, in the same, same time interval. Same time, so that's, you know, Cmax is obviously lower. So that, I think that answers your question. You had a question, Felix? To the adjuvant um, trial, I think that's um, uh, definitely worthwhile. Uh, I have two questions, just to get a feeling, uh, how large are the tumor lesions in the breast cancer? And secondly, um, are there lymph node metastases involved? So, so again, this is new adjuvant treatment, right? So, so I think all the tumors were greater than two centimeters. Um, I don't have the exact distribution, but uh, we have the data. And then I think uh, some lymph node involvement is allowed, uh, but it's very local regional. So uh, again, this is, we have more data that's been presented, so I can answer the question if you really want to dig deep. Okay, uh, I think we have to move on to the next presenter, which is Felix Kratz, and he's from the company Citrex, and he also works on albumin, and his form of drug is an albumin conjugated drug, and he's gonna talk about doxorubicin conjugated to albumin, and they have some very interesting data. Felix? Yeah. 